But uh, I wanted to welcome everybody, and, um, and especially uh, my good friend and colleague, the, the uh, inimitable Josh Parker, um, <laughs> who, will be, who was kind enough to join us um, and uh, shed some light on these issues as well. Um, what I'd like to do um, is to talk a little bit about what led to this paper. Um, and we really, when we talked about this and designed it, we really had um, a lot of desire to hear from everybody else. Um, so uh, as best we can, given the, uh, the constraints of this uh, virtual platform, uh, we'd really like to hear from you as well. So whether it's uh, in the chat box uh, to everyone, um, or asking uh, us to maybe uh, uh, relay your message, um, or even if we can unmute you and, and, and have you share some of your own experiences and insights, um, that's what's gonna make this as uh, robust as possible. So <clears throat> um, with that all said, um, I'll let Josh take a moment to introduce himself, and then um, we'll go over the first few slides and really dig deeper. Hey everyone, um, good evening and thank you for joining us for this call. We want to get to kind of our topic as soon as possible. And I do want to say too, that normally when we have these webinars, people raise their hands to talk and, and really provide valuable insights. But usually the Zoom group chat is really hopping. There's so many different people that like to write instead of um, speak. So that's open to you all as well. And I wanted to highlight that. I'm really glad to be on here with Dr. Dave Vasso, my esteemed colleague, and also Lori Calvert, and I see Ann Neary out there, Michael Dunley. So it's really great to see some familiar faces and meet some new ones. I am the 2012 Maryland Teacher of the Year, and currently I am an instructional coach for English Language Arts, and I also teach one class of journalism, which is really interesting right now <laughs> with all that's going on. Um, I'm very interested in this work because I think uh, teachers see themselves so much as classroom uh, members. Of course, that's where we live most of our lives in the schoolhouse. But what's really going to affect our classroom is going to be how we connect what we do to those that can make a difference in our districts, in our states, and certainly in our country. So I think this is a timely webinar, and hopefully it will arm us with the ability to really advocate for our profession outside of the classroom. Great, thank you, Josh. Um, so let me just give a little bit of background um, so that we can have the proper context. Uh, right now, this, uh, this paper uh, is essentially a truncated version and a slightly revised version of uh, the dissertation that I was able to put together uh, just about two years ago now. Um, it is currently available on the NSTORY website, um, and you may have received a link in the uh, member news that Lori sent out. Um, but basically, uh, as part of my doctoral research, I became very, very interested in the, the various forces that affect teacher motivation and morale. And as I was doing that research, I got much more into uh, professional identity, particularly within organizational cultures. And, and that expanded, as you know, as research does in a variety of uh, different, uh, down different avenues. Um, and essentially, uh, what I needed to do was find a group of people to interview. And so, I interviewed 24 of my uh, fellow uh, 2012 State Teachers of the Year um, and really got a, a, a tremendously solid uh, set of data uh, from which uh, six themes emerged. This particular paper focuses on four themes. Uh, that's a, a big portion of what we'll spend some time on uh, this evening. Um, but their, their insights were, were amazing, uh, very, very rich, uh, but what you'll see um, if you do take some time to read the paper, is that a lot of this stuff will seem like it's a no-brainer to you. It's absolutely stuff that will resonate with you. Um, you'll understand um, with your experiences um, and with your expertise. But the big, uh, I guess, the big idea and the big goal of the paper is how do we take the stuff that we know and, and is so deeply within us and such a big part of our professional identity and be able to explain that to various stakeholders, particularly policymakers, um, so that it's not just this abstract um, experience that we've had, but what, finding a way that it can translate into uh, real policy and, and the nuts and bolts of, of what might form, um, in a proactive way, uh, policy making. Um, so with that said, what I'd like to do is to um, provide you with what will be our kind of like our overarching or compelling questions um, that we will revisit uh, towards the end of the hour. 
um, but just to kind of provide some food for thought and then also uh, additional kind of sub questions that really form the core of the interviews that I carried out with our uh, teachers of the year. Um, and again, this is all stuff to keep in the back of our heads um, and get you thinking. And then when we uh, get into the actual themes, we, we'd really love to hear from you with some of the questions that are uh, designed as prompts. So here are our compelling questions. Uh, the first one, in what ways can we use the power of our personal teaching journeys to inform policymaking? And secondly, how can we ensure that our professional narratives actually translate into actions and solutions rather than just being the emotional narrative? So maybe the narrative gets us in the door. How can we make sure that it, that it uh, carries on meaning beyond that? And some questions to keep in the back of our heads, and, and these, again, were questions that um, among a set of questions that uh, were as part of the interview that uh, were designed to collect the data. Um, and that is, why did you become a teacher? Why did you enter education? Um, what are the things that keep you motivated? What impacts your morale? Um, wide ranging answers on this, um, but again, kind of all leading to similar themes. Uh, when we talk about issues of professional growth, not just professional development activity, but professional growth, um, what have been your most rewarding and why? What were, what were the characteristics of it that made it stand out? And, and conversely, what were some of the ones that maybe weren't as meaningful? Um, and then, and this is a question, and just as a little side note, the very first interview I did, this was the, the second question that I asked. And it was such an emotional question, and, and it hit home for so many people that I decided I needed to make this the, the last question. Um, and it was, it was a very emotional question. Uh, question and um, I think uh, you'll, you'll understand why um, but in the end how do you want to be remembered by students by colleagues um, etc when that time comes as a retiree um, or as you're moving on to other things and, and that and that was a big big part of uh, the interview so again all these things kind of filtered into this idea of what keeps us going um, why why do we do what we do why do we refer this often as a sense of uh, sort of a sense of a, a calling or a mission, and um, and essentially, what what is it that um, makes us who we are? And in fact, the title of the dissertation was from one of the quotes from a participant: "Is this is what I am? This is what I am." And so now, how do we get the uh, individuals who are not quite um, as experienced as we are uh, in our profession? Uh, to really understand that and to really get that to inform policy. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Josh, who's gonna get a little bit into our the, the first key finding um, that is carried out in this paper and one of the main themes of the research. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Basso. So key finding one is a really good one. Here's what I'd like to do. I like to go over the key finding, then ask the question and see what you all um, have to say. So key finding one from the research was the affective dimensions of teaching strongly influence teachers' identities, morale, and motivation. So you think affective, you think those things that affect you on a social emotional level, and those things that really tug at that inner part of who you are, almost even your soul. But those affective dimensions, which is, of course, different than the cognitive dimensions, the Bloom's taxonomy, the common core stuff, things of that nature. But it's really the affective dimensions of teaching that strongly influence teachers' identities, morale, and motivation. I wanna share with you two quotes from some of the teachers in this work. Here's the first quote that backs up this key finding. Some people cross the world, go on missions and things like that. For me, it's kind of missionary work. I think that it's connected to just my ethos, a love ethos, I guess you could say, and that can never let you down if you're motivated by helping others or loving others or trying to make the world a better place. I wanna uh, bring up another quote here. This one really is um, powerful to me. And again, these quotes really back up the finding that the affect of dimensions of teaching strongly influence teachers' identities, morale, and motivation. Listen to this quote. The time that I tear up is when I am thinking in my head about how a kid or a student of mine 
And I don't care what age they are at that point, overcame something and figured out on their own and is doing unbelievable stuff. And when I think that I may have played a small role in that, that's incredibly empowering. What motivates me as a teacher is empowering kids. My job, bottom line, is to authentically empower kids. And what I mean by that is that they honestly believe and have the skills to change things in a positive way for themselves and for other people. Uh, it's, it's really, some of these are really powerful um, statements. And I want to end the last quote. This really grabbed me uh, that backs up this finding. And then I want to open up uh, the floor to you all with the question that's coming under that theme. Listen to this. I didn't choose to be a teacher. It chose me. And I've never regretted it. But it's really hard work, and it's harder than you're ever going to think it is. But one student, one student is enough to make you rewarded for the rest of your life. And so it's worth it. Okay, so now for the question. How important is it for policymakers to understand the emotional aspects inherent in teaching and learning? And again, I believe, uh, I believe Lori said that you can raise your hand and, and she can acknowledge you or I guess you can unmute yourself and also write in the chat box. How important is it for policymakers to understand the emotional aspects that are in teaching and learning? Um, you know, where, where could there be barriers to that? Uh, so I'm going to kind of open the floor to you all for that. I can't figure out how to do the. Uh, uh, I, I hear you now, Kim. <laughs> I know, but I can't find the hand, so I can't do it. Okay, no worries. Go ahead. But anyway, um, I think this is extremely important. Okay. Because a lot of times, the reason teachers quit, especially the young ones, is the emotional part. Yes. They're tired. They're they're burned out because they're struggling financially as yes. well as the overload on the job, and so it's. Um, the policymakers have got to start understanding that our emotions will affect whether we're going to stay in the field or not. Yes. Thank you for that, Kim. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Hey, Josh. This is Michael. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Good. I, I think that there's so much science involved in uh, and chemistry involved in learning and teaching. And we've learned so much through brain-based, brain you know, um, research that the emotional, social, emotional learning aspects that we all have in our classrooms can always have such a huge impact on the policies side of things. And making them aware of the fact that you cannot remove that is, is I think, a key part of the conversation. Mike, that makes a lot of sense. Sometimes policymakers see um, legalese, they see numbers, but if the numbers can breathe and talk and hurt and bleed, uh, it makes the decisions a bit more um, hard to make without considering the human capital behind it. Yeah. Josh, Thanks, this is Rebecca. Um, hey, Rebecca. Hey, I, I'm just thinking about the Jim Collins work, Good to Great, and sure. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about how by telling stories, we take away the idea that there's a number that quantifies what we do. Right. When we humanize it, we don't become widgets, we become people. Sure. Not, not us, the teachers, our students, both actually. Sure, sure. That's powerful. Rebecca, let me follow up with you real quick. Do you see, um, you were at the State House, I think, today. I think you were No, there. that was That was Dana? Dana. Okay. Yep. All right. So, well, let me ask you this. Can you see a, a situation where um, telling stories and talking about the emotional aspect, where can that work and where can that work against us, I guess is my question. I would turn that question to the group, but um, I think it depends on how the story is told okay the, the context and the professionalism with which the story is related right and it depends on your goal so you can make or break a moment depending on the story you choose and the moment you choose and the way that you choose to tell it i think all of that context matters that's right that's right 
Yeah, Josh, I'd like to follow up on that. Yes. Um, I was invited to talk to the state legislator, and I thought, well, this is the time to bring my students. I work with at-risk high school students, and at that point in time, we were being blamed for the low graduation rates in our state. Okay. At-risk students are, you know, they're going to take five years instead of four to graduate. Right, right. And it was amazing how just having those two students tell their stories affected the policymakers. So now they have a five-year plan for at-risk kids. Oh, wow. That's powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. So bringing in student voice uh, really changes things. Wow. Thank you for that. Okay, um, I don't want to monopolize all the key findings because we're already at 820 as these, these times always go so quickly. So I want to toss it back to Dr. Basso for key finding and theme number two in the work. Great, uh, and, and thank you so much for uh, those insights. And I was thinking how um, this research in and of itself was, was a qualitative uh, approach. Um, and oftentimes when we think of data, we immediately have the connotation that it should be quantitative. Um, and actually that's a good segue into our next theme. Um, and, and this is something I'm sure we've all experienced either at a, at a local level or even as we see some of the, the national punditry. Um, but the idea that external views, whether they're from uh, policymakers or uh, community members, or just again, people outside of the classroom or outside of the uh, building walls, these external views impact teachers' self-perception and morale, uh, and, and not to color it too much, but very often um, it negatively impacts it, whether we're talking about PISA scores, um, going all the way back to a nation at risk, um, issues with uh, no child left behind. Um, obviously, we, we are in a, a very uh, interesting educational landscape, and it's been that way for quite some time, and it's always these international comparisons, um, the, the demands on teachers, um, and very often there's this, uh, this love for teachers, there's appreciation for teachers and respect for teachers at a certain level, but then as we go beyond that, it gets more difficult. So just a couple of, I wanna do what Josh did and uh, kind of focus on some of the uh, quotes that, that really um, give some uh, kind of a human voice to some of these findings. So uh, just a couple of quick quotes and then we'll do the same thing um, that, we, that we just did. Um, but here's one um, that I think really kind of hits the hits nail on the head. Uh, usually, there's a sense of either it's a Hollywood version of what we do where, you know, it's pretty easy to take that truculent, hardcore kid who's got so many things to overcome in the 18 hours that they're not with us, mm. and then in the six while they're with us that, you know, there's, there's no Hollywood ending usually, or at least not in the speed that they say it comes. Or the other side of things is just we waste money, we never get our act together, we don't know what we're doing. Um, another quote that again sheds some light onto this, uh, and, and the they is kind of like the universal they. Uh, they really don't have a sense of what the work is like. I, I don't think that people really understand, especially nowadays, you know, what it's like to be a teacher. I don't think policymakers, I don't think anyone really does except for teachers. Everybody's been in a school at some point, pretty much. Everybody's been, you know, to college. At least even if they've been in homeschool, everybody thinks they know about teaching. So um, with some of those quotes, and I, and I think we probably don't even need these quotes because you probably all have heard uh, versions of these in some shape or form, whether it's from family members at the holidays um, or what it might be, but we have these cultural views that have been deeply entrenched um, within uh, just the, the social view of teachers and schooling. So the question is, how can we overcome these, these cultural views? How can we overcome these political pressures and these other demands uh, and expectations on us? What, what can we do to, to change the narrative, not just by telling our stories or having students telling their stories, but to really get to the point where it becomes, for example, uh, teacher Appreciation Week, how do we really get it so that, that teachers are appreciated and, and, and held to a higher standard or uh, to more esteem in our society? We'd love to open it up, same thing, uh, in the chat box. Um, and I'm seeing some, some come in already, um, as well as anybody who'd like to, to speak um, orally. <laughs> Uh, 
Hey, this is Laurie. Um, I'd like to hear Casey explain his comment um, about concerns about internal views. I know we're talking about external views, but um, external views um, have an influence on internal views and then internal views have an impact on internal views. So I'd love to hear what Casey meant. Uh, can you hear me? Everybody can you hear me all right? Okay, uh, I just kind of meant, um, I, I don't particularly care what people outside of my profession think of what I'm doing. I know I'm doing a good job in my classroom. I'm much more concerned when an administrator, principal, a vice principal, an assistant principal comes to my classroom, sees it for five minutes and makes a judgment based on that. That hits me a lot harder than what someone outside of my classroom or my profession might think because they just don't know. So I, it really doesn't affect me at all. And if I can just sort of add to that, um, and while it's not one of the uh, findings in this particular paper that's focused on, but in the dissertation, the other the other two themes one dealt with professional development, the other one dealt with uh, the role of school leaders in school culture, and and there was sort of a sub theme related to that, and that is how. Um, administrators are often feeling those top-down demands and so how that might affect um, you know uh, culture in school so yeah great point other thoughts okay this is Rebecca I'm gonna take a risk right now you guys uh, don't know me and um, so I hope you'll forgive me as a fellow teacher, but I find professionalism often is lacking in schools and we have to earn the respect we're looking for. And I don't know what causes schools to be so, um, teachers are very harsh to other teachers frequently and not always terribly professional. And I think that costs us in the profession overall. Rebecca, this is Kim, I have to agree with you. I'm noticing a change in our teachers. We have IEP meetings and teachers are on their cell phones. Um, there's, there's just a change. We have to stand up and toot our own horn that we are a profession and we should be treated as professionals. But as you said, we have to act professional to be able to get that expectation. So I want to, I want to jump in here. I'm going to, Rebecca, first off, I want to applaud your courage, so thank you for that. Uh, and Kim, thank you for uh, backing her up. I, I agree that that is an issue. I, what I want to add to that is that I think professionalism is something that is not universally defined, um, where I, I think that, in, and I worked on a code of ethics with the model code of educator ethics with um, NASDAQ, and that kind of spells out some things, um, a code of ethics for all educators. Educators, but I just think the idea of professionalism is something that is said, but I'm not sure that people have really broken that down as to what it means um, for teachers. A code of ethics does that, but most school districts call something a code of ethics when it's really just a code of conduct. So I think a code of ethics would go a large way to establishing a baseline of professionalism so we can take back that conversation. Yeah, I'm on the um, Professional Standards Commission in Idaho, and we're having to rewrite our ethics and include social media. Yeah. Because um, that's where a lot of teachers get themselves in trouble. Absolutely. Um, and, and if I may, um, you know, one of the things that if we get to it towards the end, and, and it's fine if we don't because these conversations are great, um, but oftentimes uh, some of that might be wrapped up in um, as teachers, we often are very reactive um, to, to things that uh, might influence us, whether it's uh, locally within the building or from you know, top-down mandates. Um, and so part of what, what I'm uh, suggesting in this paper is to change from a reactive stance to more of a proactive one. And so that whole idea of teacher leadership, I think, plays very nicely in there. Um, and, and as difficult as it is and as many variables as they are, um, because I agree with you, sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Um, so how do we move from kind of a reactive approach and kind of you know, commiserating about school culture uh, with, within the teacher's lounge, you know, the, the proverbial, proverbial um, teacher's lounge complaining um, and, and changing that to where we're more, more proactive 
um, and, and really taking on this teacher leadership role, whether it's informal or formal. Okay. I have a quick question, I think, for Kim. Was it Kim that was uh, the Idaho teacher? So I can know about the social media. Yeah, that's me. Kim, just a quick question. When you said you were rewriting your uh, your ethics policy for social media, do you find that teachers getting into trouble using social media? Is it more the younger teachers or the older teachers? Sorry, I muted myself again. Um, it is mostly the younger ones. And talking with two different uh, kindergarten teachers. They, one was uh, both of them were teachers of the year. One from Oregon and one from Idaho. They're noticing not only is it the teachers is an issue, but the parents of the younger children, the kindergartners. And um, this is why I wrote in there. They're having the kindergarten teachers having to change diapers, which they've never done before. Um, the parents are not spending time with the child. They're spending time on their phone, and then when the child starts getting angry, they just hand them the phone. Mm -hmm. And so now teachers have to deal with it. And when you have, you know, like I had one kid today go, do you know how many times this teacher is on this phone all day? And I go, mm. probably a lot. And they go, yeah, all the time. So yeah. we're not setting a good example. And then you have the teachers that post things they shouldn't, and that gets them in trouble legally. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you again. So in the interest of time, we're going to move on to uh, – key finding or theme three, and we're going to go right back to, uh, we're going to call him Dr. Parker now. <laughs> no, don't call him. No, I haven't earned it. I haven't earned it, but I appreciate you, Dr. Basso. I want to add something, too, which might be sort of uh, throwing a grenade into this whole thing, um, but I will say with the advent of the new administration, I think we teachers have to also mind the professionalism with how they discuss openly on open channels the administration that's in place in Washington. I think that has been to me, something that has been disturbing, quite honestly, um, how freely some of these things are being said. Um, having said that, and we'll go back to that, um, I do want to go with key finding in theme three. So teacher's sense of efficacy is dynamic, contextual, and influenced by many factors, many factors. So teachers' sense of being able to do, <laughs> being able to do their job well, um, is really contingent upon a lot of different factors. Here are some quotes from that that really, uh, really touched me. Okay, for so many teachers, what's missing is a support component and feeling like they are living under a microscope where they can't fail, they can't make a mistake. This one, um, this, this quote is a little long, but I think it sums up some of the frustrations in a way that the other quotes don't. So I really want you to listen to this one. I think there is a constant sense of we're failing, we're not doing enough. But then there's a frustration of knowing personally that you are doing everything you possibly can. There is a lack of positivity because of the policies. You know, we're not meeting AYP or we're not meeting benchmark. We're not doing this and we're not looking at the progress we are making. And we see that progress. We see it every day in our classroom. We know how far students are coming, but that's always being pushed down from outside where you're constantly being told it's not good enough. You're not doing enough. You're failing. The profession's failing. The schools are failing. So I think that's where that policy comes in. You can't feel very good about these private victories you have in your classroom because they're not enough. I think I know uh, I've felt that before. Um, so I want to open up now for our question. Um, how can we convey the complexities of teaching and learning in a practical, tangible, and impactful way? How do we do that? How do we take teaching, which everybody thinks they know, but they really don't unless they do it, right, and do it well. Um, how can we convey how difficult it is um, to people who might come in and say, oh, this is easy. Let's just do this and this. Solved. <laughs> well, how can we do it? And thank so, you, John. Ann. I'm sorry, that's, that's Michael. Thank you, Ann, for saying, too, without sounding as though we're whining, <laughs> which is key. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. So, I mean, when you were talking about this and I read the quote, it reminds me of something that as a second grade teacher who has always had for 10 years in a row the inclusion classroom, I had difficult conversations with even parents trying to de describe student progress that 
the answer was wrong, but the concept of it being less wrong than before. Uh -huh. And the example that I give, and I say, to answer your questions, I think examples of stories. I had a student who was, you know, notoriously phonemically challenged in her reading and her writing. Her spelling was just god awful. But as the year progressed, we started seeing more and more vowels that made sense in the, in the spelling attempts and the vowels and the, the consonants that would belong in the word they were not correctly arranged or they were not 100 percent accurate but the word was being spelled less wrong with as time would go by and the lessons were being learned and so the defining of something as being correct or incorrect becomes so finely nuanced when you're talking about where a child started from and where you're getting them to go and having examples like that to be able to illustrate the nuances of what success is and how it should be differently defined in all these different situations would be a way to try to kind of add that level of the of complexity to what we do. That's really profound, Mike. Um, it actually reminds me of a book that I recently read by Todd Rose called The End of Average and talking about how lots of, we can't reduce numbers, we can't reduce teaching to a rating or a grade because it's jagged. There's so many different parts to it. And so we move away from average and get to the science of the individual, we're better able to show and describe what actually goes on. So I think the stories um, of the kids really is a key point focusing on that. Anybody else, how do we convey it in a practicable, tangible and impactful way? Hi, Josh, I wish I knew the name of the guy that spoke to our school district um, at the beginning of the school year. Um, he was very anti-public education. Okay. <laughs> so a superintendent brought him in and said, I gave him a challenge. I want you to spend one day in a classroom. Mm. And the guy had to spend a day in third grade. Okay. And then at lunchtime, they moved him to a different grade. But And I said, you cannot quit. You have to stay the whole day. You have to do exactly <laughs> what the teachers do and survive. And by the end of the day, he was exhausted. I bet. <laughs> Physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, and it changed his whole thinking. And now he goes around and he's one of the best supporters of teaching. Wow. Okay. I bet. I bet. I have this conversation with teachers all the time. If the entire public came into our classes for a week, we'd get raises double <laughs> in about 24 hours. <laughs> that's, my, that's my belief. <laughs> Uh, it's difficult work. Thank you for that. Anyone else, uh, before we move on to key finding number four, how else can we communicate how, um, how dynamic and contextual it is to teach? So um, I want to do a little plug on one of our uh, one of our good friends, Tom Rademacher. I think is his name. Tom Rad, Mr. Mr. Rad. Um, he just uh, released his book called "It Won't Be Easy," um, a slightly unprofessional love letter to teaching, and he talks about the difficulties of it. And I think that sometimes when we're able to see it through somebody else's eyes and really relate those stories, that's a way that we can really uh, convey it in a practical um, and impactful way. So I'm going to throw it back to Dr. Basso for key finding number four. Good. And, and this is all flowing into this, uh, this final theme. Um, hey, there you go. Mike has I see the book. you, Mike. I see you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Hey, I've uh, got the book too. <laughs> so uh, the, the last theme um, before moving on to kind of the bigger picture, uh, and, and this I think impacts uh, all of us in some shape or form, and that is recognize and validated teachers feel compelled to elevate the profession. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to make sure that I universalize this enough so that it, it wasn't just people who were state teachers of a year or national board certified, but, and, and not even necessarily formal or public recognition, but just this idea of, of feeling supported um, and, and wanting to do more, feeling like um, there's a certain privilege and with that comes some responsibility to, to speak for your colleagues um, to speak for your students and to really advocate for them um, in any number of ways, uh, whether that's, again, at, at a local level um, or state or even federal. Um, but this idea, this, this sort of sense of obligation 
to do something um, with this, this position. And so let me, let me share with you a couple of quotes. And again, bear in mind that these were all state teachers of the year. Um, but the first one is uh, an individual who said, uh, I'm thinking now, now that he's been, uh, he or she had been recognized, um, I'm thinking I have a position. I can use my voice and push that envelope a little bit further than a traditional teacher. And I feel an obligation to do that because to many I know, the frustrations are shared by millions of teachers, but they won't say anything because they don't have that luxury uh, of that security. Another teacher said, the number one thing with policymakers and making these changes is to get teachers involved as much as possible. They should be the heavy, not the lightweight on every decision that's made in education. Uh, it goes on to say, it's crazy to me that we would ever think of doing it um, without teachers. Now, of course, we also know that, that there are certain challenges. We can't just run up to the state capitol during period four. Um, and we, we know that it's not always easy to be uh, as involved or as knowledgeable or as, or as uh, in tune with some of the things that are going on, but yet we know um, that often they are going on without us. So um, we'd just like to ask, and this is kind of going into this, this overall idea of like what we now can do, knowing what we know, having the experiences that we've had, and that is to what extent has your involvement in policymaking increased um, since being recognized uh, as a teacher of the year or being recognized as a teacher leader? So, so what, is, what has changed? What, what sort of um, motivation have you found uh, to become more involved and to really use your voice and to use your uh, power and your platform to, to begin really uh, speaking out? I guess I'll go first again. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, since I became teacher of the year back in 2015, I've been on two state commissions and that has an impact because you have a voice and then being invited to different events just because of the new title I have. Didn't change who I was as a person or as a teacher, but it, people think it does. So take advantage of it. And a great point. And I, and I think a, a lot of times uh, we might feel pressure from people to, to speak for them. Um, you know, almost as if um, we now feel like we, we have to solve every problem. You know, people come to us uh, where we're maybe uh, in the past and, you know, it wasn't the case. And perhaps we also probably feel this idea of, you know, you, you're recognized in some shape or form as a, as a state teacher of the year, what have you. And um, 24 hours later, you're expected to be an expert. Um, at the same time, I, I think that what is particularly empowering is recognizing that oftentimes in a room full of policymakers, we are the expert uh, when it comes to the classroom. So, so how do we uh, convey that in, in a way that's kind of recognizing that we're all in this together, but at the same time realizing that we, we really do have a very powerful voice and we should be speaking that, that voice and speaking that truth. Hey, Dave, this is Mike. Um, I think that we are all advocates for our students, but when you become recognized, your advocacy can reach a new level and you can uh, really start to affect what comes into your classroom and impacts your students and other students. And it's a profound uh, responsibility that if I was told by someone who's on this, this actual webinar, you can either be a witness to something or you can be involved in it. And it, it just becomes a choice that once you've had that platform provided, do, do you take advantage of it? And uh, in some ways, I think a lot of people feel compelled that it's not a choice, it's an obligation. Mm -hmm. and thank you, Mike, great point. So I can, this is, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. This, this is Lion. So Lion, it sounds like you've got two devices on maybe? Yeah, I had two things on. Uh -huh. Sorry. I'm going to talk now with only one thing on. Awesome. Um, 
when I became the teacher of the year, definitely opened doors for me as, as a person to develop those relationships. And once you develop those relationships with your policymakers, I feel like that's when they're willing to call you and consult you and to discuss with you about um, the education decisions that they're making. And so I think those sorts of things are the things that can open up for us are the relationships that we develop with those people who are making the decisions for education. And as we all know, relationships are the things that matter. Yeah, great point. Um, and that's a little bit actually further um, in the slide deck, but just the idea that, you know, policymakers are people too. I mean, it's, it's funny to say, but just the idea of cultivating relationships um, at, at so many levels and, and not all, even not always about policy, um, but just respecting them as, as fellow human beings and, and individuals who, um, you know, who have the best intentions as well. So great point. Great point, Lyon. So again, um, it, we're going to move on now um, in the interest of time. And again, I, I appreciate um, all of the feedback and conversation. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to go to um, how kind of moving now to like specific nuts and bolts, um, making these things action oriented, solution oriented, and really seeking ways for positive, productive uh, interactions um, with, with policymakers so that not only is our voice heard, but our, our input is valued and even at a certain point where it's solicited as, as Lyon was saying. So I'm gonna turn it over to Josh. So um, I'm gonna kind of open this up to the floor. I do wanna honor Casey who asked a question to Teachers of the Year, get any pushback from the unions. If you take it upon yourself to speak on behalf of the teachers, uh, I will say that I have not gotten that. I don't know if, if, if Basso has uh, at all or anybody else on this call, but I haven't gotten any pushback from unions when I have advocated for teachers because I think there is, certainly the title brings a, a bit of ethos to the role, but I think as we speak passionately about things that are universal to teaching, it's just a hard, it's a hard sell for unions to come at a teacher <laughs> who is talking about the virtues of the profession and how we have to perfect or protect and elevate our teachers. Um, I, I try to, although I'm, I might be a different teacher of the year than others, I try to stay away from, um, from specific prescriptions on what should or shouldn't be done in regard to the master contract and all those other kind of pieces. And I just kind of stick to the profession itself. Um, so I haven't gotten a whole bunch of uh, pushback. Um, and I don't know, Dave, I'll, I'll ask you, have you got a lot of pushback as you've gone to advocate for teachers from unions? Um, no, not, not personally, um, but I know that it, it is an interesting dynamic. Um, because, you know, as a teacher um, who's representing the union, as a member of the union, um, there is a certain expectation that, that you, should, you yeah. should kind of uh, toe a party line, so to speak, um, and, and to be much more knowledgeable um, sure. about certain policies. So, um, but I think just to make the point um, before moving on, that just as we cultivate uh, relationships with policymakers. Um, we need to cultivate relationships with other stakeholders, and that includes uh, unions. and And it, it's an interesting dynamic, no question. Um, but but again, we're all sort of at the table as well. Yeah, you. It, it's um, not to belabor this point, but it's very it's very difficult to toe the line when student interests are in play and rights of teachers. So you know, we have strikes in certain places. Um, I find that it's, it's much more effective to talk about the virtues of education itself and also the right for teachers to have great working conditions and the rights for students to get great teachers than to go into specific um, points that may put you on one side or another of an argument and then the whole point is kind of lost. So I want to open up this question um, now. What has been your most significant, memorable, positive experience related to education decision making um, and why. So I'll share, I'll share one for myself. Um, about two or three years ago, I did work with NASDAQ on the model code of ethics for educators. And we got people from all across um, the country, Instoy being one of the partners at the table. And we just crafted a really, really great and malleable but also powerful set of guiding principles for our profession. They really elevated it uh, to the profession like a lawyer, like a counselor. 
And that type of decision making in terms of how are we going to put out a document that could guide what teachers think about when they make decisions was just a powerful experience for me because it affirmed some of the deep beliefs that I had as a teacher, but also I got the ability to bounce it off of principals and union people and lawyers and all these other kind of people across the country to see how the experience of education is so universal yet so nuanced. And so that was a really powerful experience for me. And now we have a document that can be used uh, for anybody who has access to it. So I open up to you all now. What has been a great experience for you related to educational decision making and why? And if I may add, if we can maybe kind of focus more so on the why, mm -hmm. um, so that, that will kind of guide us into our last uh, set of questions. Thanks, Dave. All right, I'm going to jump in. This is Mike. I just last Monday had the opportunity to talk to a room about assessments and research that I was involved with about uh, quality assessments and the, their importance. And, and the why it was the most memorable positive experience is that I had the opportunity to say something that I felt was so important for my students that I wanted to make the point to the people that as we discussed the opt-out movement, that there's more than one way to opt out. That students who are taking a test that is too challenging or too difficult and they stop halfway through taking it are opting out and uh, that the tests need to be created with the student in mind and I was able to really advocate for my students and for all students in a way that I felt it was reaching key people who, who have the power to actually make that a reality and I was able to convey to them the importance of that because of the fact that it affects self-esteem and uh, how children view themselves as learners and it was a valuable chance to have an intimate exchange like that and i felt that it was the most important thing i've achieved that's powerful thank you mike anybody else a significant experience related to education decision making uh, and also why was it so significant and memorable to you I think a lot of this, and this is Kim, I think a lot of it depends on if you're given the opportunities to be where that decision making is occurring. Yep. Um, by being on the standards commission for our state, um, we have to look at the, the um, free service education at our universities and strengthen those. And <coughs> I'm in the process now of trying to figure out how to go around my committee <laughs> to get a dance endorsement for our teachers here in Idaho because we don't have it and I didn't think it was needed until I went to one of our fine arts schools and discovered why it's needed. Hmm. So um, if we can succeed that will be my most memorable positive experience. Josh um, I I'd like to share one. This is yes. sorry. Um, this is thank you Kim. This is one that I saw State Teachers of the Year doing. Um, when I was working for Arnie Duncan at Ed, he was concerned about teacher salaries in North Carolina, which he should have been. And we set up a call with teachers for him to talk with them about salaries in North Carolina. And I asked the teachers to send me their talking points and they were horrible because there were all these fact-based things. This is gonna play right into what David's been talking about. There's all these fact-based things, like we went from such and such in teacher salaries to such and such in teacher salaries. It's like all the stuff Arnie could pull up. So I asked them to tell their stories and teachers got on and they said things like, um, oh, so um, I've been teaching in North Carolina for 20 years and my husband for 15 and um, we're each giving a pint of blood a week so we can send our son to college. There was, a my goodness. there was a state teacher of the year who said she was denied an application for a mortgage because they didn't think her job security was very good and she was the North Carolina State Teacher of the Year. Um, there was another teacher who said that she had used all her sick days when she gave birth and so she got sick and she didn't know what to do and she went to the doctor and the doctor said, I'm pretty sure you have the flu. Here's a Tamiflu prescription. You need to stay home until you're asymptomatic. And she, sure. she didn't have the sick days or the money for the copay. 
So she took Advil and taught anyway and ended up in the hospital. Well, all I want to say is that these teachers sharing their powerful truth that's amazing. Like made a huge difference on Arnie Duncan. He hung up the phone, called the governor of the state. And not only that, when reporters started asking him questions that weren't about teacher salary, he would bring up teacher salary in North Carolina. So teachers, you really know your experience and your students' experience more than anybody else. So don't don't give up on your power. Wow. Wow. Um, giving up a pint of blood that i mean in our country that that's that's abhorrent um at least that that's my opinion um so we're gonna now since we're certainly of course running out of time it's about 8 55 got our five minutes left and i want to thank you all for your engagement thank you for attending the webinar and really um plugging in hopefully you've got some really good nuggets to build your own philosophies on and have really got a chance to really share so thank you uh i'm going to give this compelling questions piece back over to dr basso to close us out um and once again thank you all so thank you josh and, and again thank you to uh to echo what josh said so going back to our compelling questions and and now maybe we can uh, spend a few minutes just answering them um, I, I think in some ways we we really uh, dissected this particular question um, and we understand, I think we all understand the, the, the power of stories, but, but now how do we, you know, if the stories get us set in the door and the stories have that emotional impact, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how do we actually get to that point where we're actually providing solutions and ideas and strategies? I remember one time talking to a legislator um, and he was moved by these stories, but he said, we, I've got to go back to my colleagues and I need to provide them with, with possible solutions. Um, not just, um, you know, anecdotes. So, so how do we move beyond that? Um, any thoughts? Um, you know, Lori, I think her examples are great, but let, you know, let's take that even further. Uh, what, other, what are the thoughts uh, regarding how we can translate these narratives and how powerful they are into actually meaningful action and solution? Because it's going to matter if, for those of you coming to Enstoy, and it's probably certainly going to matter um, in, your, in your state and in your districts. Thoughts? You know, uh, Dr. Basso, what's powerful to me um, in considering this is um, the so what. So, so ask yourself, after you've come up with your story, so what? Like, now what does that mean, right? And so I think when we're telling our story, having that branching um, transitional phrase, like, okay, so I've said the story, now here's what this means for policy. Or now here's what this means in terms of what we need. I think being able to clearly state and connect how your issues affect the bottom line and how the way the system is run is very critical. And um, using those transition words now, now here's what this means for our district, here's what we need, and then coming with something very straightforward is a way to translate that pretty quickly into actions and solutions. It takes practice uh, because, it's, you know, I think teachers aren't taught to be advocates in a policy arena. But I think once you do that, I think it, it makes it makes a difference. I, I think that we are like for, for my own personal journey, I went and became national board certified after I had uh, started off on teacher leadership. And I did that in a way to for many reasons. But one was to guarantee that I would have uh, a path that I could use to get into the right rooms where decisions are being made. Uh, and being able to get on to, for instance, the New Jersey State Standards Committee that was formed when Christie was running in, for president and wanted to get rid of the Common Core. And I, I wanted to get in there to ensure the integrity of the, of the standards was, was going to be maintained. And I think that the things that we do, the choices that we make, and the, the paths that we go down to ensure that we're in those rooms and at those tables where the big decisions are being made, is something that we can do and using your stories to get that validation and that credential in order to get to, to the, that room is, is how I am interpreting this question. 
That's good, Mike. So, so if I may, actually, I'm just going to kind of go quickly towards the last couple of slides. Um, uh, just very quickly to show you um, this movement. I know there's a lot here, and I'm happy to share this with you. But, you know, this movement from being reactive, um, and, and we're at this point here where it's this, this personal narrative all the way to the right. Um, and I'm going to go a little quickly, and I apologize, but going from reactive to proactive, where it's really focused on, uh, as Lyon said earlier, building the relationships, um, having uh, maybe legislators visit our classrooms, um, having our views solicited. Uh, once we get to that point and we're informing the process um, and proposing those ideas and solutions, that's where um, it'll make a difference. So if you can, please some, take some time to read the paper. Um, we're gonna kind of wrap some things up here. Um, thank you so much to Lori and to Josh uh, for their support throughout this process um, and their insights as well. Um, and we hope to see you this summer at NSOI where we'll really, <laughs> we'll really be uh, translating yeah. these stories into action. Absolutely.